So the title of our presentation is Creating a Quest for Immersive Learning. So as you can see, um, the context is key here. Um, I set it in a medieval village. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, just to kind of introduce the idea of the quest, um, it was selected as a presentation at the Virtual World's Best Practices in Education. So quests have kind of become a thing when you want people to come and you want uh, students to learn and you want to uh, achieve a goal, a quest is a way to kind of gamify the learning process to get people almost, um, not involuntarily, but certainly not extrinsically motivated more towards intrinsic motivation. Um, so this is kind of the uh, opening context for it. I would tend to stand by the sign, which I've recreated here, uh, to show you the, the way I laid it out. The idea was to attract people with, do you like to hunt for treasure and secrets? Click on the genie lamp to start the quest. Solve the riddles, collect treasures. And then you can see the text floating over the genie lamp. Touch me to start the quest to get free medieval clothes. So originally I was thinking, how could I get people to wear the right outfits for the medieval context? So I decided I would give away prizes, clothes, swords, uh, various outfits. Um, and then I thought, well, I could make a series of challenges. So I ended up creating 10 challenges to get my students to, one, become familiar with the, uh, the island, with the full region, um, Lingnan Drama Island. Um, and two, I, I wanted them to start to develop some basic skills. So rather than walk students through that process of, okay, press F to fly and E to go up, I thought I could try to build that into the quests so that I, in the process of having fun, they would learn uh, the basic skills and become familiar with the um, layout of the island and explore a bit. So if you guys would like to click on this genie lamp here, you can see it offers to give you a note card. And if you keep it, you'll see the first clue. And we'll go through that here shortly. But uh, you can see it's written um, in kind of a cross between, someone told me it reminded them of Shakespeare meets Dr. Seuss. So it's, uh, it's designed to be fun to read, um, simple rhymes. Um, and my kids uh, thought it was a real crack up because after you've written uh, about an hour of these things, you just start talking that way. So <laughs> they thought that was really funny. Okay, so proceeding on. Um, it was set uh, in, as I said, a medieval village, and as I was laying it out, I found some trees that I, um, I think they're called botanicals, and you can set the whole season. So here in this slide, you can see Camelot Village in the spring, and then the next slide shows the same village in the summertime, <clears throat> and finally in the autumn, which is what I decided to leave it set at. And each tree has to be set um, with an individual color, so it's a bit time consuming, but I kind of miss the, the, the look of the trees in Virginia where I grew up as a teenager. They don't have them in, like this in Hong Kong. So uh, I, just to fill you in, I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, great place to grow up. We, we had horses. Um, all right, so you can see it's a medieval village, and also look at how it's quite normal. On the surface, it's quite a typical village. Everything's quite real world, um, it's not fantastical. But then when I started doing the quest, I thought it'd be fun to build in some elements of surprise and mystery. So the castle, as you see at the end of the road there, has um, a bunch of secret doors al already built in when it's delivered, and I built some more and created some tunnels and tried to make it kind of a <clears throat> fantastical experience once you drop into the underworld surprising things happen. So I think that's part of the motivation is to surprise people, to create a mystery. What will I find out next? Some secrets, right? People love to have inside knowledge. Um, so I added horses to the beside the, the castle. As I said, I kind of miss those from when I was growing up. The interior of the castle before we um, outfitted it. And Desi, if she comes by, helped a lot with uh, filling it out. Um, she brought in a lot of uh, extra materials to provide interior decorations. Um, I found some nice uh, waterfalls and uh, spent quite a bit of time arranging the topography to, for the water to kind of flow and uh, make it a pleasant environment. 
I selected a bunch of different little houses, Tudor-style English cottages, and laid them out. As I said, it was designed to look very mm, real-world-ish, medieval, typical lifestyle. And I got a manor house, which was kind of fun to decorate because lots of room and kind of a, a rich experience. The interior shot of the manor house shows the lighting and uh, some of the uh, kind of extravagant features, lots of fireplaces and large, large areas to explore. This next slide shows the Seahorse Pub, where I started to really put some effort into uh, arranging an environment where people would want to socialize and hang out. Um, there's food on the table. There's uh, a pub of ale that, that you can get. Um, the fire's always burning. You know, it's the kind of place people, particularly the English, seem to really enjoy the pub, the pub life. Now, here's the first clue. So... Clue one, over the castle drawbridge and into the yard, turn left and walk to the trees. It's not hard. So it gets them going through, and, and I quickly found out that a lot of people don't know what a drawbridge is. <laughs> so that was one of the first places we started to notice that people often needed help. Um, the door on the left with an arch of white roses leads into the church founded by Moses. So a bit of poetic license there, you know. I don't know if the church was really founded by Moses, but it rhymed. The next part, type F to fly up and E to go higher, arrow moves forward, now you're a flyer. So the basic skills, pressing F on the keyboard to enable the skill of flying. Fly over Jesus, fly over Mary, because you're in a church. And there's the giant Catholic altar, and over on the other side, behind the statues of Jesus and Mary, are the is a secret passage and a secret door. So C to drop down, F no more fairy, so how to control your flying. Look to the right where cursor becomes hand. So that's a key element there. So they learn that they can scroll over things, and when the cursor changes to a hand, it's a touchable surface. They can open a secret door or different properties of different objects. So going to the next slide. So here's a, a, a slide showing one of my the first people who came to try the quest. So people came from, well, originally it was my students. So I had 14 students in a, a class where we were going to teach them, introduce the idea of digital literacy. Um, and so the student's task was to uh, recreate scenes from famous musicals, capture them in the, in the Second Life environment, and make a video and edit the video and present it at the end of the project. So we had about two months to, for the students to do that. And these are liberal arts students, so they have no technical background whatsoever. But then I realized, and word started getting around, people started showing up. People came by who had heard of the quest. Um, the, the hunts people, people who were into hunts, started coming by. I had really no idea that it was a thing in Second Life. Um, but after about 50 people came by, I started to realize that this might be a new way for me to collect data. So I started, I, I built in the survey, and I started collecting data from people as they came by, and I incentivized it by, giving, by creating a, an 11th level and offering to uh, give them access to the 11th level if they're willing to do my survey. So I'll show you that in a bit. So here you see the um, the church, the interior of the church, and someone's uh, pondering how they're going to fly up or over Jesus and Mary. Um, and most of this, almost everything in the quest was found on the marketplace. So rather than recreate the wheel, I just sort of browsed around looking for things. And if I found something really nice, that I added it in. It was uh, not a matter of me creating everything, but finding the appropriate things and working with the materials I had available. As you know, the marketplace, uh, you can get some really cool stuff at very reasonable prices. So I found this nice, nice Catholic um, church context for probably uh, two American dollars or something like that. Um, this shows uh, where the, the questers have dropped underneath the, the Seahorse Pub. Uh, there's a trap door behind the bar. And they have fallen into this kind of scary environment. The water's up to past their knees, and there's a pirate skeleton there. 
And when they get when they step close to the coffin, the coffin opens up and the skeleton sits up and starts laughing. It's a bit of comedy and a bit of a, a eerie thing. Some people actually feel a little claustrophobic down there in the water. Um, and also I introduced the idea of magic doors and you can see a treasure chest there. So you click to open the treasure chest. There's a, a piece of an outfit for, for males and a piece of outfit for females. And then the magic doors are a way to teleport people to different locations, to drop them into another environment to figure out. And I thought that might be kind of keep the suspense going. So rather than just walk from place to place, now they're popping into who knows where. So you know I added the horses, and I encourage people to ride around on the horses. Um, I, when I was around, I would often interact with people on the quest, socialize with them, and that element of the social construction of knowledge is one of the things I study in my research. Does it really um, make the uh, experience more engaging to have someone to talk to? And generally, people agree with that. It's more fun to learn when you learn in a group. Now, this is the interior of a giant underground spider. Um, one of the very first things I ever found it was a free giveaway, this huge spider. And when you drop in, I wanted to play on that idea of arachnophobia. So when people drop in, they're right in front of the face of the spider. And they have to climb up the, the tongue and walk into the interior. And that's where the, the quest continues for the magic door. So it's uh, on the surface of the village, it's uh, normal and uh, maybe a tad boring, but as soon as they drop into these secret places, it's supposed to be a bit of a shock, a bit of a surprise. So here's one of my quest doors, uh, confronting three skelly bones pirates along the quest. And it's kind of funny. Almost all of the pirate stuff is from Allie. I don't know if, if everybody's heard of Allie, but she gives away a ton of really well-designed stuff for free on the marketplace. Flying to follow the clue. So this is an area where I, I would give clues that they had to fly forward and, uh, and then drop down. So the idea is learning to control flying, not flying haphazardly, but flying with, with a purpose. And uh, on this particular clue, they need to walk upstream. And then I started to realize how many people don't know upstream from downstream. It's just, I guess, if you live in a city, you never really are exposed to these terms of walking up the way the water's, where the water's coming from versus following where it's going to. So. It's kind of a, a bit of a cultural thing to, ex to find out what people are familiar with, what terms. And frankly, um, a lot of the words I threw in were a bit obscure just to kind of challenge the students. Their English is a second language for them. And when I would get people from France or from Russia, they would have a heck of a time trying to figure out what some of these, these odd little used English words mean. Down into the volcano. So again, trying to explore this the fear of fire and death and asking people to drop in and people um, you can see that when they're really immersed in a in a virtual environment you start to believe or at least react to potential or perceived danger so in my um, guess I think if we hook people up to a uh, electrocardiogram that you would see their heart rates go up a lot of them as they drop into a a seemingly dangerous situation like the boiling lava of a volcano. But I thought it'd be fun to explore and lead people into these shocking places. Here at the end of the quest, so they've completed the 10, the ten challenges and they appear up in a skybox and it shows some pictures of these underwater scenes and it says, I hope you enjoyed the quest. I'd love to hear what you think about the about the virtual world. Click this sign to take my survey and I'll give you the access link to the 11th clue bonus level, the shipwreck world of the zombie pirates. And actually, some people weren't too happy about the word zombie. I found that that had a lot of people who react against that. So I found a, a bit of a, maybe people are overexposed to zombies. 
And here's a shot from the 11th level, which is all set underwater, and my kids helped me design it. It was a fun place with a, a whale fighting a giant squid and the pirate ship with all the skelly bones ready to fire their weapons. And it was just a fun place, and that's the bonus level. And uh, that's how I incentivize people to take my survey. Um, this, this slide shows the TPAC framework where you have people who have content knowledge and pedagogical knowledge and technological knowledge. And the idea is to mix the three together to achieve uh, goals that require elements of all three. So let's say you're trying to communicate content such as the skills for interfacing with Second Life. Uh, and the pedagogical knowledge will be how do I make this interesting, how do I make this exciting, how do I uh, communicate this content in a way which the students will be able to easily digest, so, you know, bite-sized chunks. And then the technical knowledge, uh, how to set up a quest, how to shop on the marketplace, how to bring things in, how to uh, make a note card giver, right? So when you click on the, the lamp, you, it actually gives you a note card. How do you set up the little treasure chests with the um, materials inside so that it gives you those, those things? And that was a learning curve for me. I hadn't implemented a lot of those things before. So as I was telling Marie earlier, it was a, a bit of an evolving process for me. I, I didn't set out with all of my goals really in mind. It just kind of developed as I looked at what needed to be done and then thought about how could I do it and then what's available, you know, what, are, what does this environment support. <clears throat> Luckily, I had some funds with, from a, a research project so I could... Uh, build out the world for that uh, class, that course that I was supporting at Lingnan University here in Hong Kong. So quest design, um, I, I thought about the Montessori perspective. So to paraphrase Maria, educating using a quest is not something the teacher does. Learning on a quest is a natural process which develops spontaneously in the quest store. So the teacher doesn't directly tell the students what to do. They're not standing or sitting in a classroom and looking at the teacher and the teacher talking, talking, talking. It's more about giving the students a series of challenges. Um, discovery learning is a good phrase, which kind of encapsulates that idea where the students are more intrinsically motivated to pursue the, the goals the teacher has in mind, hopefully achieve the learning outcomes that are intended. So finally, learning is not acquired by listening to words, but by virtue of experiences in which the quester acts on their environment. So this is the Montessori perspective on learning. Uh, you're, a lot of you are familiar with the idea of um, elementary schools where the students have a lot of hands-on time with uh, materials and musical instruments and dancing. And that's the idea of letting the children explore their environment instead of dictating to them with them sitting passively. So the quest is designed to be active learning and very much student-centered. And for my last slide, before Val takes over, um, I was trying to describe what it is to build a quest and how, how you achieve the motivation to gamify a process. And I thought about the Z factor. So if the intended learning outcomes of a quest can be represented on an XY plane like a flat chessboard, I want them to learn this. I want them to be able to get better in these ways. Then building in the fun factor of a quest would be on the Z axis. So you have to think, how can I get the students to where I want them to go, but in a fun way? <clears throat> and the challenge is to make fun kind of built into the environment, so magic doors and clues and secrets and getting rewards in the way of, in, in the form of clothing or um, jewelry, um, swords, um, a pistol that makes you get, comes with the gesture of pointing it, you know, an old blunderbuss pistol, things like that. So I'll turn it over to Val and... Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have at the end of the presentation. Great. I'm sure we'll have some more questions and want to talk some more with Brent in just a bit. 
Um, my portion, I want to talk a little bit about our, how we collaborated uh, together across distance. But first, I'm, I'm glad that Brant reminded me this evening to put on my historical attire. Um, I dressed as the Lady of Shalott, which is actually a poem by Sir Alfred Lord Tennyson. And just having a, a role that you're playing helps set the historical tone of the quest. So I'm glad that he offers, you know, the uh, free medieval clothes for those participants that might not have something. But uh, I came in as a particular historical character uh, based on literature. And um, as uh, the president of the community virtual library, what, what I really wanted to do with the librarians was find a way to illustrate what Brant was doing with the quest as a librarian. So what we did was um, I asked some of the librarians and friends of the library volunteers to um, to come in and role play and serve as participants. Um, and we helped out at the Virtual World's Best Practices in Education Conference, which was really fun. And I love the slide he showed, showed earlier, the Venn diagram that showed um, how the technological aspect and the pedagogy and the content all merge together in this immersive learning. So as I'm talking about how we collaborated, I think it is something might spark in your mind to help you think about all these different purposes and how they're all embedded within a quest. Um, I like the fact that the medieval quest was uh, literature based. So when we came in as role play characters, um, we were, there's several different parts of literature, different stories embedded in the quest. You have um, King Arthur's court there. You're undressed as a character from a poem. But to me, I kind of envisioned it as the future of a library. The whole concept of a book, you may read the literature, but you can also enter it. Just like libraries today might have films based on, on books, or you, know, you may have multimedia. In an immersive learning environment, you can put on the clothes of the character and you enter that scene or that that book or that, that history. So I think um, that librarians really need to think about this and have to, we really need to understand the potential for immersive learning in, in um, a quest like the Medieval Quest um, with Bran. And dressing the part really helps set that tone. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that I noticed about the quest as a participant and some of the things that I particularly enjoyed. And one thing that I really enjoyed was the difficulty level that Brandt put within the quest. Um, you really could do it at any level. A newcomer could come in alone and just, just kind of wander through and just browse and explore. But if you went through every single part, I, I've been in Second Life for quite a while, but I did not find it too easy. So I liked that. It wasn't super simple. It, um, I had to come back several times to actually, um, you know, read all the different um, clues and go and find all of the hidden things that were um, within the quest. I particularly enjoyed the magic doors, where um, you, could, you, you when you found the magic door, you knew you were you got it. You were teleporting on to the next to the next level. Now, not being a, a gamer, um, maybe someone who had a gaming background would would view that differently. But for me, the fact that I was learning, reading, immersed kind of in in history and literature, but um, but also going through these different um, these different levels, really brought it all together in my mind. I think um, also another thing that I really enjoyed was those surprises that Brent mentioned earlier. There were things that were kind of hidden that you had to look for that, that kind of surprised you. And um, what, I, what I felt like the, the benefit for me as a librarian and with my volunteers that helped was that community collaboration that we, that we had um, across, as I said, across global distance. We had to figure out the time zone issue because, as you know, Brant's in Hong Kong and a lot of us are in uh, the United States. So uh, finding a good time for us all to get together, you know, to, uh, to do this together at the same time zone was important. What, what the librarians did and the, the, the small group of volunteers I had, we were role playing. We were sort of like mentors or guides along the path. So that the evening that we did the um, Virtual World's Best Practices in Education um, simulation all together, we, we positioned ourselves throughout the quest 
so that if a new person came in, we would be in, in character. So I played the Lady of Shalott. In fact, I did a little bit of a reading of, from the poem as my character. That was really fun because we found people began to sort of talk in that medieval language, and, and that, that, that made it really um, a fun activity. Um, as uh, Brent gave us some tips that really helped out um, to, to help the newcomers work, and so we worked as, as uh, guides with a back channel. We had our own group so that we could kind of say, oh, I'm over with this care this person, and somebody needs to be at this other part of the quest to help that person out. And so that was that, that really helped us to be able to, um, to talk just with our group and help, uh, since there were several people all going through the quest at different times. So um, our, our experience as mentors along the path I found really um, interesting and something I had never really experienced before. And I felt like this really went hand in hand with what librarians do in the physical world. We were helping people, but we were helping them with virtual resources. And in this slide, you see a lot of us at the end of the quest talking about our experience and uh, with some of the people who were there uh, during the Virtual World's Best Practices in Education Conference. Um, and we found people from all over the globe that came through uh, and discussed that with us. I really liked that the quest could be done alone or it could be done in a group. And I experienced it both ways. Myself alone going through the quest was a very enriching and enjoyable activity. You could go through, it, there was learning embedded in all of the clues, it was literature based. But yet I had another experience with doing that with a group and with the role play of people, you know, playing characters and interacting with each other. And both I found very, um, very educational and, ver and as well as enriching. And um, as Brent was saying, it really, uh, that social cons construction, you know, for me, one of my favorite um, developmental psychologists as I was um, in my early years of teaching was Vygotsky. And, you know, Vygotsky is the child development psychologist who says that we learn in, uh, in collision with each other, you know, constructing our knowledge together. We don't just learn all by ourselves, but we challenge each other with our ideas. And, um, and he's the one who has the zone of proximal development where you have someone that's just learning something and some, somebody else knows a whole lot more and, and you sort of scaffold the learning. You know, whether it's with a teacher or with another student that knows a lot more or with a guide. And that's exactly what was going on with the quest. It was totally the zone of proximal development. You had people with different skill levels all helping each other um, in different ways within a virtual world, which I think is, um, is a really has a lot of potential for, for the future. Um, so that's some of the things that I felt were really um, important. As Brent mentioned also, there was the um, cultural elements and the cultural challenges. We had one participant during the Virtual World's Best Practices in Education conference that came to our, our session who barely spoke English and he went all the way through the quest and several several of us got to interact with him throughout the um, the evening and then in this slide he sort of looks like he's wearing a space suit there and at the end he came and talked with all of us about what he had learned he's a, he's a teacher and it was it was just really really um, interesting to have different cultures different co countries all interacting acting and learning together uh, in the quest built built here um, by brand so it's there's so many different things going on at the same time that that we can talk about here that it's it's really quite amazing but but for me I felt like it really went hand in hand with what librarians can offer in virtual worlds so that was really exciting so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it back to Brandt and see if there's some other things you have questions for us. Um, as I said, my, my role was organizing some librarians to help as role guides, as role players and um, guides or mentors along the path. Uh, but that was my main my main contribution to the quest. Um, I feel like it's just a great example for anyone who's looking for. Examples of what you can do in a, in, a, in a virtual world to embed just high quality learning. So, um, any questions? <laughs>